Thank Amy, everybody in healthcare as well. Uh, they've been through so much, and so for all of you who are in that realm, uh, thank you for what you do and for serving so faithfully. So I'm um, really glad you're here. So whether you are online right now or you're at one of our locations or you're podcasting or something, um, and, and wherever you're coming from in terms of your journey, some of you are longtime Jesus followers who just want to grow deeper in your faith and apply the Bible to your life, and this is obviously an opportunity to do that. Others of you are maybe very new in that journey, trying to figure some things out. Maybe some of you are, are not a Jesus follower, but you're open, and we're so glad that you're here. And some of you maybe hate Christianity or hate the idea of it because uh, you've been exposed to a version of Christianity that's not very much like Jesus, and I understand that. And so wherever you're coming from, again, we're just glad that you're here. And I think today as we hear from Jesus, uh, we're, we're looking at one of his teachings today. Um, I believe wherever we're coming from, it's gonna be uh, super helpful as we continue our series, Thank God It's Monday, which is about work and, how, and what God says about this part of our life. And in what we've seen so far is that this part of our life matters way more than we might think uh, because it's part of God's creation mandate. And today we're talking about leadership and what good leadership is really like. And for some of you are like, oh, I'm not a leader. Um, you, you have more leadership than you think because at its essence, leadership is really about influence. And we all have influence in different spheres in our family, in church, in our neighborhood, in work, in our relationships. Uh, but some of you have some kind of leadership position uh, as a student in your school or in your workplace or volunteering or however. And, uh, and so as we think about leadership, it's why I have this mug, you know, world's best boss. And like Michael Scott on The Office, I, had also, I also had to buy it myself uh, because of all the years of being a boss, nobody's ever given me a world's best boss mug. Isn't that sad? And, uh, and that tells me something, that I need to hear this talk that we're going to look at uh, today and, and hear what Jesus is going to say about how to be the world's best boss or how to be a leader, how to steward our influence well. Um, because we all know the power of leadership. Uh, Solomon in the Old Testament, who was a king, and so he knew a little bit about leadership, he said this in Proverbs 29, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. A whole nation or an organization or a neighborhood or a community rises and falls, every organization rises and falls in large part on the leadership. And, and when leadership, when leaders are good leaders, people rejoice and they have joy in their work. And, and when you have bad leadership, people groan. And we've probably all experienced that in the workplace. I'm I hope you've had some really great leaders in the workplace, some really great managers, some really great CEOs or principals or administrators. I, I, I hope you've, you've, had to, you've had the opportunity to experience that because when you have a really good boss or a really good manager, I talked to somebody just before the service who said, yeah, the, the person who owns our company is just such a great person and, make, and, and, and makes work so enjoyable. And it it's lifts you up, right, when that happens. But You've also probably experienced the other side of that when bosses are not so great and leadership is, just makes you groan. And all of us, I think, want to be the kind of leader that leads to rejoicing, that leads to flourishing in the workplace. We all want to be that kind of leader, but it's not natural to be that kind of leader. And so we're going to hear from the greatest of all time, Jesus, talk about leadership and a certain kind of leadership that is not natural but essential and, and required for those of us who are Jesus followers, because from God's perspective in the Bible, when you and I are given leadership, when we're given influence, that is a stewardship, meaning God gives it to us, not for us, but for others. And how you and I steward our leadership and how you and I lead and all that, it's not about us, it's about lifting others up and helping others flourish in, their, in the workplace, which is so important because people spend most of their waking hours at work. And therefore, it's a huge responsibility. And so what does it mean to be the right kind of leader? And we're going we're gonna to hear a story or look at a story in the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, that is one of those amazing stories in the Bible because you wonder why it's even there. 
Because other religious books about, they, they tend to only share good stories. Actually, every other religious book just shares good stories about the heroes. Um, the Bible is not like that. The Bible, because it's truth, I think, but it's just authentic. And so you see good stuff and bad stuff about leaders, and you think, wow. And this one, with two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, I promise you, they were like, really? Does that really have to be in the New Testament? Like this, not that story. Like there's so many good stories, you know, but not that one. And it's not just in one book in the New Testament uh, because there's different books about Jesus's life and this one's repeated because it's such a significant learning. It's such a significant conversation. And, uh, and so we'll see. It's also a funny story. So in the book of Matthew, we'll be in Matthew 20, 20. And here's the story. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, now, we know that's James and John who were brothers and, and they were both disciples. They were also really close to Jesus. So you got mom and then you got James and John. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons. So they're all together, if you picture that. And kneeling down, asked a favor of him. So she knows by now that Jesus is not just some ordinary rabbi. That Jesus is the Messiah, the one promised from God. And she may begin to understand by now that this is actually God in human flesh. So she's putting all this together and she knows the prophecies in the Old Testament that eventually, she thought it would happen sooner than later, that the Messiah would make the world right again, this broken world, and would reign from Jerusalem and there'd be a new heaven and a new earth and everything would be great. And she thinks that's about to happen right now. And she's excited about that because her two sons are among his 12 disciples. And so she's got a little request, or not so little. Verse 21, what is it you want, he asked. And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now what she's asking for is, is, is just basically that they would be number two and three people in the universe. That's all. I say, look, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not asking for your chair. I mean, you're God and everything, so I wouldn't, pre that's presumption. I'm not, not gonna ask that they would take your, that's your thing. I mean, if you wanna talk, we could talk about it. But I, but I think, uh, you know, but my sons are so great. They're so wonderful. I think they would be perfect to be number two and number three in the universe. Now, you may wonder what James and John are thinking, right? Because they're right there. And, and are they thinking, oh, mom, Stop it. You're so embarrassing. Everywhere we go, we can't take you anywhere. This is, you don't ask questions like that. And you might think that's what was going on, but evidently not. Because Jesus, when he responds, as we're going to read, responds not just to mom, but all three of them, because all three of them were in on this. I don't know if they asked mom to do this or if it was mom's idea, but they're all three in it. And uh, so, you know, helicopter moms, that's not new. Uh, you know, we think it's, we invent stuff. But Matthew 20, 22, this is what, how Jesus responds. Not just to mom, but to all three. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Again, not just to her, to them. And then he looks at the two brothers, James and John. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. They have no idea what they just are saying. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they've been prepared for by my Father. Meaning God, when, when that time comes, and it's not gonna be soon, they don't know that yet, God will figure that out, that's his job. But how does he respond to the request to be in the big chair? It's number two and number three in the kingdom of God in the universe. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you really prepared to drink from my cup? Now, what is he talking about? When he says, are you prepared to drink from my cup? Well, what he's talking about is, he refers to it this way several times, is that when he talks about the cup, is the cup of sacrifice and suffering that's associated with leading, with giving your life to mission, with the divine mission that he's committed to. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you know that story where he's arrested just before the crucifixion and he prays, he says, Father, if there's any way to take this cup from me, any way, I don't want to drink from this cup. 
I don't want the sins of the world to be on me. I don't, I don't want that. If there's any other way, but God, it's not my will, but your will, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And he did. And that's the cup he's talking about. And he said, are you really prepared to drink from that cup? And he's talking about sacrifice and suffering that comes to giving our life to a mission and to be involved in leading in God's kingdom. It's not, it's great, but it's not easy. And it comes with a lot of weight and a lot of responsibility, leadership does. That's why James, uh, not this James, but Jesus' brother, James, who wrote the book of James in the New Testament, in that book says, you know, probably you shouldn't want to become a leader. Because if you become a leader, you're going to be judged at a higher standard, talking about eternal reward. You're going to be held accountable. So you probably don't even, you think you want to be in the big chair, but you really probably don't. Not many of you should want that. Because he's talking about the weight of leadership. And I know a little bit about that. In fact, I'll never forget this event, this moment. So uh, years ago, I don't know, 18 or something years ago now, uh, we, I, I was on staff here, but Gene Gatz, who started our church, we did a leadership baton pass from him to me being the lead pastor. And so the week, bef the week before the, when this happened, we did the baton pass and all that, like, uh, you know, everybody thanking Gene, okay, here's this new guy. And then, uh, and then during the week, I was fine, although people from around the country, for some reason, felt obligated to reach out to me and I guess encouraged me, but they would say things like, you know, um, good for you for, you know, doing this, but good luck. <laughs> because, and people said that, like, because you don't want to be the guy who follows somebody like Gene Guts. You want to be the guy who follows the person who follows the guy, right? Because this one never works out. Like, you're I'm like the sacrificial lamb. Somebody used that phrase. Like, thank you. It's, you obviously have the gift of encouragement. I appreciate that, right? And, but I was fine through that week. But then Friday night, so this is the first service where I'm the lead pastor, Friday night service, just a few minutes before the service, the band was doing pre-service music. I was sitting on the front row and the church was packed because we were starting a series called 40 Days of Purpose, which was a really big series, but even more so, and it was also January, but even more so we, I think, I mean, the church like doubled in attendance that first day because people were curious to kind of see the train wreck, you know, <laughs> kind of see the boy fail, see how long is this guy going to last, you know, so you know, it was just all this going on energy, and I'm on the front row, two minutes, three minutes before the service, and I did not expect what happened, would happen. The Bible talks about a mantle of leadership, and that mantle of leadership, that weight of leadership just went, whoop. I mean, I just felt it on my shoulders, just whoop. And it was, and I audibly, out loud, people around me, even though there was music playing, would have been able to hear me. I just said, oh Lord, I can't do this without you. If you don't show up, I'm in big trouble. I need to know that you're gonna show up. Of course, he never has a problem doing that. But I've felt that weight ever since. And I believe I'll feel that weight until I pass on this role to someone else. It's the mantle of leadership. And everybody wants the big chair, everybody wants, until you, but then when you get in that chair, you're like, oh, you know a little bit of what Jesus was saying. Do you know what you're asking? Because there's a weight, sometimes even a loneliness of leadership. And it, it's, it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful platform, but it comes with a weight. It comes with responsibility. If you're a conscientious leader and see it as, hey, look, the decisions I make and the things I do matter because it matters, like people's lives are gonna be impacted by this, however you lead. And that's what Jesus was saying is, do you know what you're asking for? Well, the other disciples, they are close to this conversation and they start catching wind of what's happening that mom and James and John just asked to be number two and three in the kingdom. And we know from different uh, parts of the New Testament uh, stories about Jesus's life that multiple times the disciples argued with one another about who was gonna be first in the kingdom, which one of them were gonna get the bigger chair. They argued about this kind of stuff. And so they were ticked off. They were like, oh man, he did an end around and it should be, you know, they're bozos, it should be us and all this is going on. And so Jesus, before it escalates too much, stops, stops it, calls a huddle, says, okay, team, come on, let's have a conversation. 
Verse 25, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, other Gentiles, and their high officials exercise authority over them. So he's talking about the Roman government and the leaders, how leaders, everybody wanted the biggest share they could get and their titles and entitlements and hoopla and everybody wanted to be, you know, admired and wanted the big titles and wanted the, you know, all that stuff. And he said, you know how that works, right? And, and with great pomp and circumstance, they lead and want people to serve them. But even they have to serve other people because they have higher authorities that even are bigger big shots that act like a bigger big shot and rule over them. Basically just self-serving leadership. But then one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible, not so with you. Now, these are the leaders who are gonna be taking the Christian movement forward. And he said, okay, we know what leadership is like out there and people see it as a platform to be served and to be entitled and to have all that. Not so with you. That's not the way we roll. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Son of Man talking about himself. That even Jesus, as God in human form, did not come to be served, but to serve. Because that's God's character, by the way. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Pointing to the cross when he would give his life as a ransom for you and me, paying the penalty of sin. And Jesus is saying that's the way we roll as leaders. That leadership is not a platform to be served, but to serve. Not so with you. I, I, as I read through this passage this week, it was, it was really striking to me, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna print out that phrase and just put it somewhere in my office so that every time, every day, every, you know, all through the day, I see that not so with you. Go ahead and put it up there. Because I asked them to, to put something, make some things that we could print out. So if you do your phone uh, to that, it'll get you to something that if you wanna print it out and put it in your office, if you're a manager or a leader or something, not, or a parent, not so with you. Because he calls us to a different kind of leadership. And it is rare. And it is powerful when it happens. Uh, I remember when I did become lead pastor, and this was maybe a couple weeks after the moment that I shared so I was about two weeks in or something. And we were, I was driving my youngest son, Caleb, who was seven then. And so he was in the car with me and we're driving away through the parking lot after church to go to lunch or something. And, and, and he had already, you know, he knew that we have a staff of people and that I was leading the staff. But then uh, he, we're in the parking lot, right? And there's hundreds of people going to get in their cars and he's looking at all these Chase Oakers getting in their cars and his eyes get big. And he said, Dad, are you the boss of everybody? <laughs> this little seven-year-old mind, right? That, talking about you, all these people out there. Are you the boss of everybody? And I'm gonna tell you how I respond because a lot of times I don't get to share these stories because a lot of times when I have these opportunities, I say something stupid. But this time, I actually said something pretty good, like, like worthy of, of the mug, you know? So I'm gonna share it with you. And I, because I, it's what I said, I said, Caleb, and it comes from Jesus, didn't come from me, but I said, Caleb, no, I'm not the boss of everybody. That's not what leadership is. When you become a leader, what that means is you're not the biggest boss of everybody, it means you're the biggest servant of everybody. The leadership is just an opportunity to serve people and to lift them up and to encourage them and to help them when they're in difficulty and to help them know God and to help them do well in life, that leadership is about serving people. It's not about being the big boss. It's not about being served. It's about being the biggest servant. That's what I get to do. And then I get, it's easy to know that, but it's not as easy to live that out. To live consistently as a, a, what people call a servant leader, a Jesus kind of leader. But it is so rare and therefore so powerful when people do. And as you think about people in your life or in your work who've lived that way, you know the power of it. And I wanna make sure for those of us who are as leaders that we get this, not so with you. Hey, we roll a different way. What does it look like to lead this way? So we're gonna play with it just a little bit. 
And, uh, and I'm gonna steal from a Jesus follower who's also a business uh, best-selling author and business speaker and coach that you may have heard of. Uh, Ken Blanchard is his name. He blew up really big years ago. He wrote a book called Five Minute Manager. He's written lots of books since then. But I love the way he talks about leadership and this kind of, of leadership. So let me uh, do some, it's been a while since I've done artwork, so we'll do some artwork. Um, I don't know if you can tell what this is. Can you tell? It is an org chart. It is not a Christmas tree. Okay, so here's, so, so every organization, right, has some kind of org chart like this. And uh, you got somebody at the top and then the management team and then these people and, the, and all the way down the thing, which is fine, right? There's, there's a purpose for that. But, but so he says, okay, so this is the way leadership typically works in American, he was talking about business, but like, so you got the per- people on the top, right? And the people down here. He said, it's really important that we maintain this and here's why, because the people at the top, the reason they're at the top, they're called supervisors. And the reason they're called supervisors is because they have supervision. It's like a superpower. The rest of us, we can't see anything. We're clueless. But these people have supervision. And we really need people with supervision because those of us down here, we're called subordinates. And the reason we're called subordinates is because we are subordinary. And we subordinary people desperately need the people with supervision. Otherwise, we'd be so lost, we wouldn't know what to do. And so, and right, he just keeps playing that out, playing that out, playing that out. And typically, that's the way it works, right? You have people who think, you know, they're there, and, 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 and everybody exists to serve the people at the top and so on. And Jesus says, no, not so with you. Now, we're going to inverse the, it, we're going to put, we're going to invert this in a little bit. But I will say this, and he says this, that, this kind of pyramid actually does work in one area of leadership, and that is vision, decision-making. Like somebody's gotta be held accountable for vision. Somebody's gotta be held accountable for making a decision. Otherwise, any organization is like going on a really bad date when you go out with somebody and you're like, well, where do you wanna go eat? I don't know, wherever you wanna go eat. Well, what kind of food do you like? I like everything. Well, okay, I like everything too, you know, but, but what, what do you, oh, whatever you want. That's what I want, just whatever you want. Well, I want whatever, you can do that for an hour, right? Be a really bad day. At some point, somebody's gotta make a decision. Somebody's, and that, so th- that's true. But in all other areas of leadership, he argues, and I think Jesus would, you really just flip, the, flip it in perspective. Do I have to keep drawing or are you getting this? Okay, yeah, okay. Right, you, you flip the pyramid. And you realize, hey, my job as a leader is not to be served by the organization. My job is to serve people in the organization. I'm the biggest servant of all. Making sure I lead the organization or lead my team or manage my group or whatever I do in a way where they can flourish, where they can live out their calling and live out their gifting, where I'm not being mean or micromanaging, where I'm, a, where I'm developing them and encouraging them and not robbing them of recognition, but sharing recognition and, and giving opportunity and giving and cre- all that stuff, right? That my job is to serve, not to be served. Now, when you hear that, I think it's pretty easy to be like, oh, you know, that's true. And, and, uh, and I think I, you know, I'm a pretty nice person. I think, I think I'd probably do that. And I'm just gonna ask you and me, because I can, I'm with you just to tap the brakes a second. Because this is actually, maybe we're not as good as we think at this. Maybe we could be significantly better. And here's why I say that. So um, last week I talked about a businessman in Dallas who sold a very large company, made a whole lot of money, and he wanted his last check, last check to bounce because he didn't have people, he didn't have heirs, and he and his wife, and uh, to just give just make ministry happen, and, and he did all kinds of stuff. Well, one of the things he did is he took an interest in, in some of us pastors around the country, and for some reason, <laughs> I guess God was gracious to me, he took an interest in me. So I talked last week about something he allowed us to do. Here's another one. So uh, this was about 50 pastors around the country, and, and these guys were all like, you would know who they are, if, you, if you're around church circles a long time, you've been a Christian a long time, you know many of these names and you'd wonder, well, why were you there? Me too. They were wondering that too. I know that. But anyway, they were, so it's just great people, right? Okay, so we're, and, and he put us together for, we spent a day, actually we did this twice, 
uh, we spent a day with Jim Collins, who is a, another best-selling business author, kind of business guru. Uh, there's no way we could have had access to him or afforded that if he hadn't put that together, and he knew Jim because of business. And he wrote a book called Good to Great and Built to Last. So this was, I think, when, I think it was Good to Great, when he was writing the book, he hadn't published it yet, he was doing his research. So he's meeting with us 50 pastors, sharing the research of how organizations, and he studied these, had these criteria, how they went from, you know, good enough organizations to great organizations. And he had a definition of what makes a great organization, the ones that we just say, man, wouldn't it be great to be part of that? Well, how does an organization go from good to great? That's what he was talking about. So he had all this stuff that he learned from all these companies, but he shared the most significant for last, as he said it. And he said, what's true of 100% of these companies, all this other thing that he talked about weren't necessarily true of 100%, but this one's true of 100% and is the most important from our research, and it's this. Organizations that went from good to great had a certain kind of leader and he called it an L5 leader, a level five leader. And he had the criterion. But basically what he described was a leader who was humble, who was teachable, who cared more about the mission of the organization, the advancement of their career, and who saw leadership as a platform to serve, not to be served. And every one of those organizations went from good to great the reason they did, the biggest reason is because they had that kind of leader. Now, we are a bunch of pastors. Jim is not a believer. He's not a Christian, all that. So, you know, we're there and we're looking at each other kind of like last week, if you remember that story, a little bit cocky thinking, that's Jesus. Like, we know that. You know, we, that's what Jesus said. And, uh, you know, just kind of giving each other that look of like, hey, we know that. Like, this is Jesus stuff. But then he said, so when I work with leaders, which he does, so what I've found is that this kind of leadership is incredibly rare. Instead of, of the leaders that I work with, if I'm being very generous and optimistic, I would say 10% are this kind of leader, but it's probably less. So now I don't hang out with pastors. I'm not, he, he's like, I'm not a Christian. I don't know your world. Um, so I don't know, but here's what I would guess about you in this room, 50 large church pastors from around the country. My guess is the ratio would be the same. That I'd be generous to say 10% of you are this kind of leader. And you could hear a pin drop because we kind of knew he's right. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I... God, am I that kind of leader? And, and what would it look like to be more of that kind of leader? Because I wanna be a good leader, but I'm not Jesus. And he calls us to be Jesus kind of leaders, so how can I be a better leader? How can I really lead like that? And I want us all to think about that. In whatever influence you have, in whatever leadership role you have, what would that look like to be more like Jesus than you are right now? Because it really matters. People's life where they spend most of their waking hours if you're in the job is at stake. So how can we do better? And I've been thinking about that over the last couple of weeks, knowing I'm talking about that. And here's, here's something that came out for me. You come up with your answer. I want all of us to have one answer. But for me, just to kind of get us thinking, here's the one, here's my, I'm gonna get, let you cheat off my paper. Here's what I came up with. And that, I, I meet with a lot of people, a lot of staff people throughout the week. And, and other people too. And so here's my new goal in those meetings, that I want, at the end, by the end of every meeting, for whoever on our staff or whatever, that by the end of the meeting, when they walk out of my office or whatever room we're in, that they are on cloud nine, that they are lifted and encouraged, even if we're having a hard conversation, even if it's about something that, that maybe they need to be doing better than they're doing right now, because we all need to be doing better than we are right now. We, we all have that, right? But the people that I get to work with are really awesome people who love God and who love this mission and who want to do better. And so even if we're having a, I mean, it's easy with an easy conversation, but even with a hard conversation, my prayer is that I would be able to interact and relate in a way where they feel lifted and valued and listened to 
and appreciated and understood. And so I, I've been pray, uh, kind of practicing that over these last few days. And, uh, and it's pretty amazing when you have that intent and you pray that God will help you to see people who are like, they're like lighter and more energized because that's the power of leadership. We can have the opposite effect or we can have that effect. So that's my deal. You can, you can steal that if you want. Or how about another one? Think about approachability as a leader. I mean, this story is a crazy story about approachability with Jesus. Now, remember who Jesus is, okay? Now, we believe Jesus is God who took on human form, came among us. So this is God, the creator of the universe, the, I mean, ruler of everything, okay? This is like God, okay? So when, when they have their little conversation, they're talking to, to God, and this is quite a conversation to have with Jesus to say, hey, um, would it be okay if we were like number two and number three in the kingdom? And look at how Jesus responds. Because he could have shamed them. I mean, for one, they even feel like they could have that conversation, which is amazing. But he could have shamed them. He could have yelled at them. He could have, but he doesn't. He just says, guys, um, you know, I don't think you know what you're asking. I mean, that could happen. God's gonna make those choices. But in fact, you are gonna drink from the cup and you're gonna be engaged, but... That's a lot, that's, I, don't, I don't think you know, I think you need to rethink it because I, I don't think you know what you're asking. But he doesn't shame them. Even when he pulls, the disciples are arguing about who's greatest, he just pulls them in and says, guys, let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it means to be the greatest. You wanna be the greatest? That's awesome. I, you know, I want you to be the great. Let's talk about what it means to be the greatest because if you wanna be the greatest, if you wanna be first, cool. Just be the biggest servant because that's how that works. He, even in a weird conversation, right, related in a way where they would feel empowered to keep approaching him with weird stuff, not shamed. How could you do that? Why would you do that to me? Never come to me with something like that again. There was none of that. And think about all the different people. Jesus is God, right? Think about all the different people that found him so approachable. Sinners, which were all sinners, but people labeled that way. Lepers, outcasts, the marginalized they all felt completely comfortable because Jesus was so approachable. It's a powerful leadership lesson. God, the ultimate leader of the universe, is approachable. He's not intimidating. He could be, but he chooses not to be. So how about us? Are we approachable? Um, I mean, you can keep going with this, right? Am I, am I, do I actually think about my employee or the people that I, I lead and, and think about how they can develop? Am I encouraging them? Am I, speaking, am I speaking truth to them in gracious ways when we have to have a hard conversation? Do I honor them? Do I listen to them? Do I receive input? Am I open to feedback about my own leadership? And am, or do I get defensive and you know, create this you know, weird environment where people can't say hard things to me? Am I approachable? I mean, those are all great things to think about. So I'm just gonna encourage you Right now in your heart, just to think, you know, this is one thing I could do as a leader to be more like Jesus. And, and then we're gonna actually do something together. So, and we're gonna do a little spiritual activity like right now that Jesus actually asked us 2,000 years ago to do. And for those of you who are new to church, you might be thinking, uh-oh, what's he gonna do? Are they gonna start bringing out snakes? Or well, I don't know what this is. I, I, need to come, I need to go to the bathroom. Um, chill out. Uh, you don't have to do this, and, and nobody will know if you do it or not. So, um, if you want to do it, you can. If you don't, you get a, you get a pass. So, um, because th that's why when you came in, you got that little thing with the juice and the bread on the top. And if you didn't get one, raise your hand so ushers can get one to you. There's uh, some multiple people who didn't get one. Um, and, and what is this? So this is a, a worship experience, honoring Jesus for being the kind of leader that we're talking about, of giving his life as a ransom for many. And it's not only a way to honor him, but also a way to remember, not so with you. Like, we're called to live the same way. And Jesus, on the last supper that he had before the crucifixion, he, he passed bread and, and he broke it and he passed it around. He said, hey, remember, as you do this, this is my body. It was broken for you. Talking about dying on the cross. And then passed around the wine and he said, as you drink this, remember, this is... This will remind you of my blood that was spilled for you to, so that you could have a whole different kind of relationship with God, a whole new arrangement with God. 
And, and that's why we drink the juice and eat the thing, to remind us of what Jesus did all those years ago and encourage us to be the same kind of people and the same kind of leaders who sacrifice and serve. Um, and I'm, I'm, in just a little bit, I'm gonna hand it over to your campus pastor at, at the campus, but a couple of quick things. One is you may be wondering, hey, am I allowed to do this? Like, can I do this or not? Because in a lot of church traditions, I'm not throwing rocks at this, you, you can't if you're not a member or if you haven't been through a bunch of classes or something like that or not in their denomination. And the Bible doesn't, just doesn't give any instructions about this, about who can take it and how and all that. So um, that's the decisions they've made. We're not that, that's not the way we roll. So we're not that high control. We're more freedom oriented and then that. And so all that to say is you decide, like if you wanna honor Jesus this way, I don't care where you're on your journey, if you wanna honor Jesus this way, then please do it. It'll honor him and, and I think it'll be meaningful for you too. So you can, you can do this, you can play unless you don't want to and that's fine. Um, also, just so you know, the little crackers, gluten-free. Uh, the wine is not wine, it's grape juice. Um, which means if you have a problem with alcohol or gluten, then you don't have to worry about either one of those. And, uh, and really, this is an opportunity for us. We call it communion because it's a time to commune with God. I think God, well, we know God is uniquely present in this moment. And so you say, man, I, I wanna know God. I wanna meet with him. Well, this is a great way to do that because in, in, we'll have some reflection time. Um, it'll be an opportunity just to pray and to be with him and evaluate our life in light of, who he is and what he's done for us. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the campus pastors at each of the campuses. And for those of us here, I'm just gonna walk us through this. And, and a lot of times here, the way we do that is we pass it out and then have music and you kind of have your moment and take the elements whenever you want. Sometimes we do that together. Today, we're gonna do it together. But first, I wanna give you opportunity um, so I'll, I'll walk us through when to eat the little bread thing and, and when to drink the juice. But I wanna give us just a moment to commune with God and to pray and, and, and to be with him in this moment. So uh, you may wanna bow your heads or however you wanna do that, but I'm just gonna give you a moment to be with God in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your grace, your mercy, that you did not leave us in our sin and the guilt of our sin, but you sent your son, Jesus, to become sin for us, as the New Testament said, to take on sin that he didn't have, to take on our sin and the guilt of our sin and to give his life as a ransom for us, to die on the cross, to take the penalty for sin. And you offer forgiveness and relationship with you as a gift and we wanna celebrate that and thank you for that. And Father, I also pray that you would help us learn from that to be that kind of person and that kind of leader. As he said, for the son of man does not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna continue in a spirit of worship and prayer as we are gonna sing an incredible song that, that celebrates what we're talking about when we celebrate communion um, and Jesus as the servant leader that he is, graves to gardens. And so let's stand and sing together. Yeah. 
much. And, and for the record, um, he's not my boss, so I never didn't give him that kind of cup. But anyways, Jeff, I mean, you exemplify that level of leadership. And I think I have witnesses here that could testify to that. So thank you for modeling Jesus for all of us here. And of course, I believe that Gene passed that model down as well, because Gene is that type of leader as well. And I'm, I'm trying to follow you guys in your footsteps. Hey, um, if there is something that, man, you need prayer for, we have two options that you could find, that you could be prayed for. The first is either texting the word pray to 58578, and we'll send you a link where you can fill out your prayer. And we have hundreds of people that pray every single week for all the prayer requests that come in. Or our care team would love to pray with you. They'll be over there to your right, hanging out, and you can get prayer from them directly. And if you're new, please come out to the hub. And also, again, every Monday as we draw for free lunches, you gotta submit either your business card, who has business cards anymore, but if you don't, we have cards you can fill out your name and we will fill it out. And come on, brothers. We've only, we've only had women win so far, all the women. We've been having women win, but anyone can go in there and fill out your name and turn it in. It's in the hub to the left uh, of that desk, and we'd love to give you guys free lunch on the house for you, coworkers, buddies, family members, whatever you want. We're not going to audit it. So anyways, but hey, have an amazing rest of your weekend. God bless you guys. We love you guys. We'll see you later.